Philippians, and we've come tonight to learn from it. Uh, we ask that you would fill Pastor with your spirit, illumine our hearts, fill him with boldness, and we'll praise you for what you do among us. In mm. Christ's name, amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, as we continue our series in 1 Corinthians. And, of course, remembering that when chapter 1, he says that you all speak the same things. He's trying to get set some things in order in the church. And he dealt with the fornication. Now, here he begins to deal with the sacrifices and specifically idolatry. This was a very pagan city. And they had a lot of bad practices and bad habits and a very evil and lascivious culture. And much like the one that we're in today. Our culture is only getting worse, and we make idols out of all sorts of things. And we're going to deal primarily with idols in this chapter. I want to give you some stats or some facts, if you will, on this chapter. First of all, there, there are 13 verses total in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And in these 13 verses, it actually mentions the word idol seven times, which happens to be the most in any New Testament chapter. So this is very important. This is a, a foundational chapter for understanding idolatry and how the church should deal with it. Uh, it deals with the word knowledge 11 times in this chapter. And it also has the word conscience five times, which it's actually tied with 1 Corinthians chapter 10. They both use the word conscience five times. What's interesting is 1 Corinthians 10 also dealing with eating sacrifices, things sacrificed unto idols. So these two chapters are very much linked, and we're going to look at both of them tonight, chapters 8 and verse 10. Because listen, the Bible was translated in context, and the Bible is important to understand in context, and we read it in context. And any time somebody throws a verse at you, make sure you read the context if there's ever a time that anybody says, yeah, but what about this verse? I would encourage you, say, well, let's open it up and see what it says. And it helps when you look at the verses before and the verses after, and you begin to understand the heart of what God's trying to teach us. Context is so important. And so we can't just pull one verse out and then build a doctrine and ignore the rest of the passage because you may find out there were deeper things in the passage. And so dealing with idolatry and the knowledge of idols and our own conscience, we're going to be looking at that primarily tonight. I want you to look at verse number one to begin with. Verse number one, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, it says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now go down and look at verse number 7. He says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak, is defiled. So he's dealing with people in the church that are eating food, meat, sacrificed unto idols, which are pagan gods, and there's this contention, well, you can't do that. Well, yes, I can. It's kind of like, well, we're free in Christ. Yeah, but should we continue in sin? Well, God forbid. And so anytime we go to one extreme or another, sometimes we often have to find that balancing of the middle of the road. This is very important. And so these two verses begin to give us uh, the landscape of what we're looking at here where we're looking at uh, idols, knowledge, conscience. And so let's start back at verse number one. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now, this is huge. He says, listen, we know what idols are. We, are, we, are, we kind of know what he's, he's talking to the church that is aware of what's happening. He says, we have knowledge of that, but here's the problem. Sometimes we get knowledge of something and it puffs us up. It makes us proud that we have this knowledge. And he says, but charity edifieth. Now, what does edify mean? Build up. Build up. So think about what he's saying. If you know too much and you use it wrong, it'll puff you up. But what we should do is love someone else and build them up. So instead of being puffed up, we should be building something, somebody up. Uh, this happens oftentimes if you're, I, I, you know, I'm a health nut to a certain extent. Uh, at least I have a lot of knowledge about certain things. Just recently, 
uh, I was somebody was saying, oh, but you drink those Diet Cokes and that's got aspartame in it. <laughs> you know, and I had to chime in. I said, by the way, you know, an Air Force pilot is not allowed to fly if they've had a Diet Coke because of the aspartame. It creates methanol in your brain. It'll cause you to hallucinate. Maybe that's what you need to get through the day at work. But, you know, you know, and they're like, oh, I didn't know all that information. Now, I wasn't trying to attack them with that knowledge. But had I used it very accusatory, say, you're, you're using methanol and you're trying to get high or whatever, you know, oh, that's terrible. That's going to rot your brain. I can't believe you're drinking that stuff. If you don't come with knowledge, you know, tell, speaking the truth in love, if you don't do it with charity, sometimes we offend and we don't accomplish the goal. So knowledge in and of itself isn't bad. But if you use it like a hammer all the time, you're hurting people instead of loving people. Sometimes you're better just to keep your mouth shut and love them then give them more knowledge than they need or want now here in dealing with idolatry in specifically he's saying we all know about the idols we all have some knowledge about what it is or what it isn't but don't let your knowledge overwhelm you this is important um, because he's saying we should build people up uh, I've been guilty of this on certain issues in the past and I've especially seen people where you know they have their their particular topic that they know the most about. And anybody that doesn't see eye to eye with them, boy, they like to attack you. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, what's one of those topics? Flat Earth. Flat Earth. Oh, man. He had to go there. <laughs> he t the Flat Earth. All right. So if you're fully persuaded that the Earth is flat, then you have to convince everybody around you to see it exactly your way, right? And many other people, well, I've looked into Flat Earth and you're dead wrong and I hate you all, oh, you're all a bunch of idiots now. And that's the other extreme. How about in the balance, you know? I don't know. I mean, well, the Bible says it's round, and that we know for a fact. So we'll stick with what we know, right? Um, and, you know, another one would be Christmas itself. And you think about the idolatry of Christmas, right? Oh, well, you know, oh did you know what, do you know what Yule time actually is? Oh, do you know what uh, Saturnalia is? You know that famous song on the radio? Do you know what they're actually singing to? Okay, well, is it necessary for you to go and blast your grandma and tell her that she worships idols because she has a nativity set? Whereas you maybe allow some Santa in your life. Now think about it. Santa is a wicked idol. That shouldn't have to be said. And listening to these songs that, that speak of lasciviousness and drunkenness, that is, that is unchristian and it, is, it has nothing to do with the season where we celebrate the nativity of Jesus Christ. So all things should be in balance. You can say, yeah, I've heard of that and I know about that. But that doesn't mean I have to go around telling everybody about it. And so they had a problem. They weren't in unity on this subject of idolatry, things sacrificed to it, and specifically eating those meats. So that's how he's setting the stage. Uh, verse number two, he warns us. He says, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. Sometimes it's good for us just to step back and be humble and say, well, I think I know this, and hey, I could be wrong. Now, we know what the Bible says, and there are other things that are somewhat vague. Uh, in chapter 10, he uses a, a, a very similar statement. He says, therefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. If you're standing and it's on false information and you don't stop and consider yourself, then you may fall because of your pride. So in verse 2, he's warning, you think you know something, but you don't know anything. And we'll, you'll use that same topic, flat earth. You know, if, if somebody that says, I'm convinced of the flat earth, but they won't even give a little concession and say, you know, I could be wrong. It's like, you know, NASA, they just use internet images. And how did you learn of the flat earth? Well, I found these images on the internet. Hmm. Hmm. So you trust these images and I trust those, or I trust, or we don't know which ones to trust. Sounds a little confusing to me. At least we could say, hey, this is what I believe and here's my opinion because, and hey, I could be wrong on certain things that are way out of my scope that I'll probably never know as long as I live on this earth, right? So certain things we should be humble about and say, I think I know, but in all reality, if I'm too proud about it, I should just say, you know, and maybe I know nothing. Maybe in all reality. So he, he's trying to warn us from being too proud because the goal here was not to get puffed up, but rather to build up the people in the church. Verse 3, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. And there's where, where unity comes in and love, loving your brother. I love God, so therefore I love the brethren and making sure that you're not, uh, you know, attacking somebody over one of these issues. And now I just want to get into what is an idol. I want to get into uh, idolatry itself and if you have a pen, you may want to write some of this down. I want to give some Bible definitions. I want to help us to understand what an idol is, okay? And he starts in verse number four. He says, as concerning, therefore, 
the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods, many, and lords, many. Now, this is interesting. So he goes right in and says, now, we, they say this is an idol, and we think we know what it is, uh, but there is only one God, and we know that God is not an idol, and God doesn't like idols, yet he's jealous over these images, just as much as if any man put up a, a picture of another woman and said, that's my wife. Oh, man, that should not fly. That would not be right. And so that's how God feels when somebody makes a religious image and calls it God, or they take some inanimate object or some feeling or passion, and they worship it and, and desire it more than God. God gets jealous, right? And so uh, that's how he feels about idols. But notice he says in verse number five, they are called gods, lowercase g, G-O-D. They are called gods. But we know there's only one God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that He's our Creator, and that this inanimate object, this statue, he, it is not our God. So that's important. That's kind of how He starts out. I want to define it with Scriptures. Go to Colossians chapter 3, if you would. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. So an idol... He says, is nothing in the world. That's a strong statement in that he's saying, uh, consider that it doesn't really have any power over you other than the power that you give it. And that's where we'll get into the conscience. And he says, there's one God, but these things that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, you may say, well, this is, uh, you know, you know how the Catholics are very idolatrous. Uh, there, I don't know if you know this, there is a saint for television. And it was some guy that had some vision you know, 100 years ago, and they say, oh, this is the saint of TV, and people put a glow-in-the-dark idol next to their TV. All right, they have all these saints that they pray to, all these idols and statues and, you know, dead things that, oh, that, this is the saint of heaven and the saint of hell or whatever, all these strange doctrines that come out in the world. Now, this culture in Corinth was very pagan. A lot of that was absorbed into what would later become the Roman Catholic Church. Not all of it was entirely identical, but he says they are called gods, and there are many gods, lowercase g, and many lords. Well, that's the master. They're serving is part of the important thing. You're in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, Colossians 3, verse number 5. Look at Colossians 3, verse number 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, listen, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now here he gets into a really interesting subject that coveting something is idolatry. Now this is important because we all probably are guilty of coveting things at different times. The first mention of idol in the Bible is in Leviticus 19. It says, turn ye not unto idols, nor make yourselves molten gods. So in Leviticus 19, he mentions idols. He talks about this is something people are turning toward, and he calls them molten gods. We kind of already had that. The molten goes along with graven or uh, 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 carved, right? Uh, Leviticus 26 is the second mention of the word idol. It says, Ye shall make no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. So he's dealing with something. These gods were worshipped. In the first and second mention, it says they turn to them or they bow to them. Covetousness is the one you're looking at. Go to Romans chapter 7. I want you to understand that idolatry happens in the heart. Idolatry happens in the heart. The Lord has uh, given instruction for certain uh, religious symbols, if you will, or even graved work before but they weren't considered idol. And you say, well, what's the difference? How do I know? Where, where can we discern this and understand what is and isn't an idol? And it really comes back to the heart. These, in the Old Testament in Leviticus, and what he's dealing with in 1 Corinthians, they made a statue of some image, half man, half beast, who knows what, and they said, this is our 
God, our Creator, our Judge. This is the one that gives me blessings if I bow down to it, worship it, follow it, sacrifice to it, do whatever the priest says, okay, those kind of things. So you're following it with your whole heart. And it was amazing that Israel was destroyed because of the idolatry. Idolatry was such a huge issue that God really judged them for that. You're in Romans 7. Look at verse number 7. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. There it is again. Thou shalt not covet. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So covet deals with your desire. And these are the words that we have to beware of. Our desire, our worship, our coveting. What do we, when we are in danger in this life, you say, well, well, Pastor Fannin, I would never make something with my hands, whether by wood or stone, uh, make it of a man and say, this is my God and bow down to it. Some people will use, well, a Christmas tree is an idol. Does anybody in here bow down and worship a Christmas tree? No. Now, a Christmas tree is tradition, isn't it? Now, if you're not teaching your children about Jesus at Christmas, and all they think about is presents and Christmas trees, and then you're failing as a Christian because you're teaching them something with everything that you do. Christmas is the time that we give gifts to other people as Christ gave the gift of his eternal life to us. So Christ is the ultimate gift giver. We're following suit to him. And so uh, we shouldn't make, you know, we shouldn't, you know, attack anybody that has a tree. But if you feel like a tree just isn't for you, then, you know, this, is, this deals with your own conscience. And again, we're going to get into conscience here in just a minute in the chapter. You're in 1 Corinthians 10. Look at verse number 6. Now, these things were our examples unto the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So he says, lusting after evil things, committing fornication. This is, this is important. Lust equals an idol in your life. What you covet, what you desire, you are in a sense worshiping it. You're giving your affection and your attention to that. Things that you would rather do than be in church. Or when you find yourself perhaps, you know, in, in our age, it's, it's the cell phone, isn't it? Boy, I, I want to look at my phone, but then there's my Bible, right? There's, there's us halt between two opinions. Well, maybe I want to see something or talk to somebody, but then it's like, you know, but I need the knowledge from God. And so whenever there's anything that would get in the way of God, especially in a worship or lustful or desiring, then, then that becomes an idol. In the same chapter, in chapter number 10, look at verse 13. He says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that ye are able, but ye will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. He says it again. But this time he says, uh, there's temptation. Now, these are some interesting words. You just think about what's happening here. We go from a wooden statue, a graven statue, a picture portrayed on the wall to something you desire, something you really love to do. Maybe food can be an idol in your life. The real issue, again, it goes back to your heart. Um, it says in Ezekiel 14, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of them at all? God speaking to, to Ezekiel, the elders came to him, and they were godly men. But he said, listen, don't listen to them. They came to inquire of God, but they have idols in their heart. They've set up some other desire in their heart. They're lying to you. You don't see it, but I do. And God was revealing that to him, that idolatry happens in the heart. It happens in the heart. And when anything has the ability in your life to capture your heart or steal your affection, yea, your worship, your desire, your lust, then you're in danger 
of le letting that and allowing it to become something that would cause you to sin. I use the example, you know, the, the brazen serpent, right? We call it today a caduceus or a caduceus. We see it on the ambulances. The Bible calls it uh, Nehushtan, I think, Nehushtan. Uh, it was the serpent on the pole, they would look and live. It was a picture of Christ being on the cross, that we just simply trust in Him and we're saved from our sins. But that, that image, that, may, that was a forged item and it became something they worshipped. It became something they worshipped. Now, and that's why we don't have a cross and it's not that crosses are inherently bad, but we know that the Catholic Church they bow down to crosses and people hold that. I mean, more people wear crosses that don't trust in Jesus than people that do trust in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Isn't there something wrong with that picture? And people will superstitiously hold their cross or rub it or I'm going to pray to my saint, whom, whoever, you know what I mean? And But they, they don't understand the Bible. Their heart isn't right with God. They're trusting more in this relic than they really do in Jesus. And that has become an idol. Idolatry happens ultimately in the heart. And, you know, he started the chapter in verse number 8 talking about building up, not tearing down. And we, with some knowledge, oh, you have that image? That's an idol! But be careful with that. Be careful with that. I was talking about, about this recently, one of the men in here, somebody else that uh, he had asked a pastor, well, what about my chess set? It's wooden. It's images. That's an idol! That's an idol! Really? Throw it away. I would throw it away. Really? We don't worship it. We don't bow down to it. Sounds like loser talk. <laughs> Sounds like loser talk. We, wouldn't, we wouldn't use a chess piece and say, this is my king. <laughs> All my power comes from this little chess piece. I'd be a little worried. I'd say, man, you're crazy. Right? <laughs> now, I, I, listen, the thing is carved images and images have a tendency to captivate us and capture our attention. And when that becomes a problem in your life, and you're desiring it more than God, it becomes an idol, no matter what it is. So it's not about, well, how is it carved or where did it come from? Because even inherently, Jesus on a crucifix isn't an idol, but it is to the Catholics, which is why we're not going to use it. We can look at that picture and say, yes, that's a picture of Christ, but I don't worship this picture or I don't worship this wood or this stone. I worship the living God. He's not made with hands, and that is. And I don't worship anything made with hands. We shouldn't, but as human beings, we have a tendency to make things and then say, wow, aren't I good? Look what I made. In fact, this is the best. I'm going to set this on the mantle. We should all use it. And what happened? We you know, put tradition and superstition, and ultimately when other people begin to worship it, sometimes heirloom relics and hand-me-downs become like, that was grandfather's. You know, it's like, whoa, careful now. <laughs> you know, like, that's grand. Even if it was a Bible, think about it. Well, that's grandfather's Bible. Have you ever opened it or read it? No, I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Well, let's not, you know, esteem it more highly. It's great to have these things handed down, but we should never let anything get in between God. This is so important. What is an idol? Well, it's God. This is lowercase g. It's false gods. It's worship. It's an image. It's, a, it's something graven or molten. It's something we covet or lust after or we desire after. Now, you're still in chapter 10. This is important because remember earlier said, an idol in the world is what? Nothing. But look at chapter 10, verse 20. Look at this. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Now, this is an important statement here. We, when, if somebody says, this is, this is Jesus on the cross, and, and they mean it and they worship some crucifix, you should say, no, it's not. I have to, I have to separate and tell you the truth here. He's warning us that the people have a tendency to worship. When it says gods, what does it mean? Devils. Devils. Any time that the devil can use anything to get you to lust or covet or be distracted or give your attention, affection, or worship toward anything else in this world and take that away from God and steal your heart, that's the devil at work. All the more when he can do it with a little image and say, these be thy gods. Isn't that what happened with the, the, the uh, golden calf? Yeah. Go back to chapter 8, if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So again, the real issue 
It wasn't the angels that were carved in the temple. Those weren't idols. There were pomegranates in the temple. Those weren't idols. Unless people worship them. Idolatry happens in the heart. That is the real issue. And we live in a world where we love things. We love stuff. I mean, we're in, a, in such a time right now where it looks like, you know, a financial collapse is imminent. It's the perfect storm. Everything could just collapse. And only those that are holding physical possessions will they survive. And it's like, I need stuff. I got to get stuff. And it's like, no, we need to get right with God. We need to trust in the Lord. That's the only thing that will protect us on the good days or the bad days is trusting in the Lord and making sure that we're not giving our heart to something else. TV is the idol of our generation. Growing up, I heard preaching, it was called the one-eyed God, because that's how people treated it. The world we live in, most people face it. Most people today, they watch, I don't know the numbers, it's still 30, 40 hours of television per week. That, I mean, some of them don't even work that many hours, but they're watching TV that much. They live to go and just sit down and turn on TV and be told something and be fed doctrine that is anti-God. TV, Facebook, social media, YouTube, fill in the blank. Obviously, it's all changed with the advent of computers and the Internet, and, and they're pushing things. There's all this pressure from the world to love things, to get stuff. I've used the example of the, the little old lady down the block, and she tells us about her three-year-old every time, her three-year-old granddaughter, every time we see her, and every time it's the same. She calls me up and tells me, I want, all the, I want this baby doll, and I want this, and I don't know where in the world she gets that. And I said, oh, Miss Davis, she gets it from the TV. When, they're, when, the, when she's watching TV and it says, buy this baby doll, have fun with this toy, you need this, what do you think is going in their heart? It's creating idolatry, covetousness, worship, lust. And this is the danger. There are people that make drugs an idol. There are people that make pleasure an idol, seeking what they desire. Some people, it's mental pride. I've got all these degrees and I know more than you and, and just getting more information or having some stature, that becomes an idol because you put that before God. Some people, it's their family. Oh, well, I can't come to church because of my family. Or vice versa. Oh, we're so good. We got it all figured out. I, think, I mean, anything in this world, the devil can use to be a stumbling block and cause us, even you know, famous personalities. Everybody's got somebody they're following. Well, it shouldn't be that way. We're following Christ. We're following Christ. If you're following some person, you tell me how great and smart and everything they say is just gold, be real careful there. Be real careful there. Let's not elevate them. Uh, political leaders. Oh, man, have we seen that lately with Trump? Then listen, <laughs> Biden's an idiot, and, and Harris is on her way in the office, and all. I mean, and that's terrible what they're doing, but don't, don't, let's not elevate Trump as if he's the one that will save us. I mean, when the Republicans are yelling that, I'm saying, we got to stop. we got a problem here. What about Jesus Christ? You've elevated a man to the position they don't belong. Many people, their wealth becomes a form of idolatry or their religion or worse than that. And I, I think it's sports. Isn't sports what catch, captures most men's heart that we know? Most of you men probably know men. They can tell you things, how tall a guy was, how long he could throw, how many yards he's ran, what team he worked for first, who his coach was in high school, where he's going next. They'll even sit and pontificate about if they put this guy with that guy in this season in that city, I think they'll do this. And then you're like, you guys are nuts. And they literally have these fantasy football leagues where everybody gets together and they come up with these harebrained ideas and it's absolutely nothing. It's meaningless, but they made it an idol. They've made it an idol. You say, well, that's not an idol, not, not sports. Okay, have you seen anybody that has a Jaguar on their head or on their chest or on their car? A flag outside their house, on their wall. They've got it everywhere. They've taken that image. And that is the most important thing to them. That has value. Oh, it's, it says Jaguar on Oh, it says Coca-Cola on it. You know, when you, when, you, when you go after a brand. And listen, uh, marketing, they're not dummies. They've figured out that human beings, we have a tendency to follow a brand, right? Well, I like, I like this brand jacket better than that brand. Or these britches over those. These work boots, I tell you, they're the best. Hey, even guns. I mean, we could have an argument about guns real quick in here, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah, I see you guys back there hiding. <laughs> you know you're guilty. You can just say amen. We'll move on. All right, anyway. Uh, so let's not make anything an idol to the point where we push God out. And it's entirely capable with anything. Cars, houses, people, all of that. Usually it's pleasure, desire. I know what I want and I want to get it. I don't care who gets in my way, even if it's God. Whoa. We've got to be careful. 
you're back in chapter 8. Again, God wants a broken and a contrite spirit. That's the spirit he wants from us is humility. Um, in verse 4, again, he said an idol is nothing in the world. It's only what you give it. And as a Christian, don't give it more authority over you than you should. Look at verse 5. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods, many, and lords, many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we in him. Uh, God is our creator, and he is our judge, and everything that we have to do, we have to deal with him. And there's a problem. He says, verse 7, how be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Here's the problem. You say, well that, well, that was offered to an idol. This came out a few years ago. Oh, that certain meat. Did you know that meat? The Muslims take it to a Muslim slaughterhouse, and they say a Muslim prayer. And so you go to Walmart, and you get XYZ brand beef, and you're actually eating meat sacrificed unto idols which is completely forbidden a christian should not be eating something sacrificed unto an idol but he introduces this concept of conscience and it doesn't just show up here in the bible the conscience is your own voice i think sometimes when god talks to us he does it by our own voice not by a mysterious booming voice it's that small still voice that seems to confirm with the Holy Spirit and agree with the scriptures and sometimes that's how God works to lead us and guide us but here he says there there are some they have a conscience of the idol they're worried about this idol and they eat this meat and their conscience being weak their conscience is defiled the application here here's a universal application anything that is of doubt is sin I believe that's Romans 14, is that right? Or is that James? I, I, James, okay, so if, if you're in doubt, you feel like, if you're driving 95 miles an hour and it's a clear road, and it, you know, and you're, but then all of a sudden you feel like, ooh, I should probably slow down. You should probably slow down. You should probably slow down. And if you say, well, what if I have an extra portion? Ooh, am I being a glutton? I should probably slow down. What if you're just really, in, oh, that sports car and it's got this, and you can't just say, you're like, Am I giving too much attention to this? Then it's probably of sin. If you're doubting yourself, if the Holy Spirit and your conscience are working inside of you, and, it, and here is a guy who, weak in his conscience, defiles himself because he goes through and does what he ought not, and he sins. Verse number 8, he says, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat it are we better, are the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. This is an interesting concept here. We're talking about building people up. If I eat meat sacrificed unto idols, is it healthier or will it make me sick? Is it the worse? Probably neither. It's just meat. Who made the meat? Well, God. And look, I know that curses have power, and I know that words can destroy, and we've probably seen those, the, the, those uh, demonstrations, if you guys see that, where they show the rice that says love and one says hate. And just by looking at it and reading it, you're projecting a different spirit. And, it, and, and the, the rice will corrupt that says hate, and the rice that says love stays preserved. And anybody can recreate this, and, and it's just an interesting little tidbit about science, that we do have energy. There is power of death and life in the tongue, and if you're speaking death and hate, it's going to destroy. If you're speaking love and compassion and lifting people up and edifying them, then it will build them up. And so, but he's trying to tell us here, it's just meat. And if your conscience is weak about it, then you should give in to your conscience and do the right thing. He says in verse 9, But take heed, lest by any mean this liberty of yours be, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Well, I can do whatever I want, as long as it's not a sin. It's, it clearly it doesn't say I can't eat meat that came from this country. It's not a sin, unless it causes someone else to sin. If it causes someone else to be offended or be a stumbling block to them, then I should allow my liberty to be judged and to submit to the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at me in an idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Now this is a whole nother level because he's dealing about sitting in an idol's temple. That's where worship happens. Should this guy be in the idol's temple eating meat? I don't think so. I don't think that's right in Christ. 
And you say, yes, but I can show you in the scriptures, it's okay. Or even, you know, it, it's all under grace. Yeah, but should we be in an idol's temple? God forbid. Should we go to a bar and get a, get a hot dog, hamburger, men? No, absolutely not. Well, let's extrapolate this for a second. We went and got some Chinese fast food the other day. They had a big Buddha doll standing on the counter. Uh-oh, is that an idol's temple? There's a fancier Chinese restaurant on the other side of town. We've been to it a, while, a long time ago, three, four years ago. And I saw it on Google Maps the other day. And they changed the listing. It says, uh, Secret Tiki Temple of the Gods or something stupid like that. And I saw it, and I said, well, I'm never going back there again. I didn't like how it smelled when I went the first time. I'm not certainly not going back now, okay? Now, if somebody says, we sacrifice unto a God for this food that we're serving you, what should the Christian response be? You know what? I'll go without. This is what's being taught in the chapter. If you start eating and you look over and it's like, huh, they got statues here. And your conscience does it make you feel convicted like, oh no, I'm partaking at an idol's temple. If, if your conscience is clean, eat the food. God made the food. It's, well, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If it be uh, sanctified with, 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 with um, uh, prayer, help me out, somebody. <laughs> Thank you, prayer and thanksgiving. So is it inherently an idol? Now, here in verse 10, though, he's in an idol's temple and he's eating meat from there, he probably shouldn't have done that. Because especially if a weaker brother that says, well, I saw brother so-and-so, and he's going down there where they worship other gods. Why is he in there? Verse 11, and through my knowledge, um, through thy knowledge, shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now, this is really interesting. Here, we're dealing with conscience. And I'll just take a second. We're almost done. But bear with me on this. Conscience. He's introduced conscience. He told us, that our conscience, that there are those with a weak conscience. Um, if you would go to go to Rome, go to Acts chapter 24, please. Go to Acts chapter 24. We're warned about a reprobate that would have a seared conscience. We're warned about the children of the devil that would have a defiled conscience. Paul said that he has a pure conscience and he strives to have a good conscience. And so it's important for us to understand uh, when we have a brother that is weak that we should try to help them out rather than to offend them or cause them to stumble. Romans 14 says, He that is weak in the faith, receive ye him, but not to doubtful dispu disputations. You shouldn't go into these doubtful arguments where neither side can be proven. We've had friends that were vegetarian. We didn't try to sneak some meat in and make them eat meat. Now, if he came in and said, You guys are in sin because you're eating meat, I'd say, No, sir, <laughs> you just have a weak conscience. Now, the idea here, though, is if, if somebody's eating things, uh, worship, that, that, that others worship or, or act, you know, like, they're, like it's going toward another god, we should be really careful with that, and we're better to walk away from it and have a clean conscience. So our conscience should be clean and pure. Uh, the goal of your conscience, you're in Acts 24. Find Acts 24, verse number 16. Verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and men. What should your goal in life be? To have a clean conscience with God first and then with men also. So you don't have, you're not causing people to stumble. Go to Romans chapter two. Go to Romans chapter number two. So we wanna have a clean conscience, void of offense, that's the goal. And how we do it, the, the Bible tells us, you're in Romans chapter two, look at verse number 15 which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness. Now the conscience is a witness. It is a witness. But it also says of the law. Now the law is God's word. And when you have God's word in your heart, 
to lead your conscience, your con you can have a pure conscience toward God. Go to Romans chapter 9. Go ahead just a couple chapters. Romans chapter 9. Go to verse number 1 when you get there. So your conscience is a witness that's with you, right? And it's to help guide toward God's word, toward the law. Verse number 1, it says, Romans 9, 1, And I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. In the Holy Ghost. Notice that. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So the conscience works through the word, through God's, God's law, through the word. We have our own conscience, but then he also mentions the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will reveal things to us, and it's important for us to not grieve the Holy Spirit. And if you feel like what you're about to do or what you're in the middle of doing is wrong, and, and it's the Spirit leading you, you have your spirit and your conscience both. These are separate things inside of you that are working, okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, look at verse number 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. We have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, Word. Your conversations, your walk and talk. He says, I have a clear conscience that in a simplicity and godly sincerity, not f fleshly wisdom. He's saying, I'm not judging myself with fleshly wisdom. Well, I'm not as bad as them, or I didn't break those laws, what the world says. No, it's in godly sincerity. It's sincerity. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter, go back to actually chapter 10, if you would. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So it's kind of interesting that God, when you're saved, gives you the Holy Spirit. But every man already has laws written on their heart that come from God. Everybody knows it's wrong to steal when something is stolen from you. We know that it's wrong to be assaulted when somebody assaults you. We know that murder is wrong and abuse is wrong when it happens to us. Now what happens is people defile their conscience, they sear their conscience, they get selfish, they don't care about God or man, they're not worried about that, and so they begin to do all these evil things. But we as Christians are on the flip side. We say, no, you know what, I want to do what's right before God. And when I begin to go down a path and I feel the Holy Spirit convicting me, and my conscience bearing witness, and I know what the Word says, I think those three things should be active and working inside the Christian as, our, as sort of our compass so that we know what is right and we know where to go. You're in 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to finish with this real quick. Look at verse number 18. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the sacrifices which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. So here's the real issue. Uh, going to a Chinese restaurant is not inherently evil. Buying meat that may come from a foreign country is not inherently evil. But if it's presented and it's clear that this goat meat was sacrificed specifically in a Muslim way and they prayed to Allah, as a Christian, although it's just me and it's nothing in the world, they meant it for something because they sacrificed it unto a devil. And so you should stay clear of that. With a pure conscience, through the Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God, some things we should be separate from. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he. Again, he's talking about fellowship. You don't just sit down with God's people and with the devil's people. Those things don't mix. Verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And that's where people will use the verse, well, I can do whatever. It's free grace, right? Yeah, but God has his children. He's given us a commandment to do certain things, and if we don't, he will correct us. And so you could say, well, if I ate that goat meat, it's a sin that Christ died for. It's not going to kill me. That much is true. It's lawful. But he says, all things edify not. 
The goal is not to get puffed up because you know something. The goal is to build up by doing the right thing, by leading the right example, especially when there's a brother that's, that maybe doesn't have the knowledge you have or they're weaker in their conscience toward certain things. So what do I do when I go shopping? I go to Walmart and I'm not sure. Do I have to Google each one to find out which one comes from a Muslim country? Look at verse 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. If you don't know, then it doesn't hurt. But if you do know and you find out and you think it's a sin, then it probably is a sin. And rather than defile your conscience and continue in sin, you should stop what you're doing and change your course and make sure that you give God the glory. In fact, that's the whole point of the rest of it. Look at verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If you find out, if, hey, don't you know what you're eating? Okay, well then I'll stop. Then I'll stop. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Listen, verse 31, here's the key. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now this is the point I meant earlier like with Christmas stuff. Is your Christmas tradition giving glory to God? If not, you should change it. If not, you should change it. If you have snowmen and Santas in your front yard and you have five Christmas trees in the house, but you're not teaching your children about the nativity of Christ, then I would say you need to change that. What, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give not offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And there's the key. When it comes to idols, yes, it's nothing in the world. However, in their heart, when they sacrifice to a devil, we need to make a clear separation and say, my conscience won't let me have fellowship with devils. And no offense to you, but I'm not going to partake in that. Why? Maybe it's an opportunity to preach the gospel and get somebody saved. So we as Christians should be separate. We should be sanctified. We should not uh, sit at the table with devils. And we have a conscience for a reason. When, when something is in doubt, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We can pray to God. We have the Word of God. And then there's our conscience that bridges it all together. And if in your conscience you're feeling like you're about to do wrong, then you need to listen to your conscience and have a clean conscience before God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. Lord, I pray that you would... Uh, help us to be able to better recognize if there's any idols in our life, anything that we give more attention or care to, to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us this time of year to get focused on you. I pray that you would help us to see others saved. We ask this in Jesus' name.